something beside me A light to the kerosene And the places aren't real anymore And the faces don't say anything Welcome to Devil's Chess Club. I'm Aaron Good. Today, Bryce Green and I are going to be talking with the Green Party presidential candidate for 2024, Dr. Jill Stein. After I worked on the Obama campaign in 2008, and I even attended the inauguration and the staff ball, I then voted for Jill Stein in the next two elections. So I'm very happy and a little amazed to be speaking with her today. This episode of Devil's Chess Club is available to everyone courtesy of Four Died Trying, the new documentary film series which explores the extraordinary lives and cataclysmic assassinations of JFK, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and RFK. There's now a Patreon page for Four Died Trying. It offers patrons a number of other perks, including a new Four Died Trying podcast and access to the already released films as well as the new chapters as soon as they are released. Devil's Chess Club is an American Exception production. Subscribe to the American Exception podcast on Patreon for access to the podcast that explores the deep politics of the U.S. empire. We have over 170 episodes and counting, including a currently ongoing series featuring Ben Howard and I as we discuss Peter Dell Scott's overlooked work on Far West and the Global Drug Metagroup. I believe that this is truly illuminating material, bringing much light to the U.S. Empire's clandestine underworld, which has served as the dark matter, harnessing a political economy of crime and violence to sow chaos for the neoconservatives' doomed quest for a new American century. With that introduction out of the way, let's talk to Green Party presidential candidate Dr. Jill Stein. Dr. Jill Stein, thank you so much for joining us. It's so great to be with you. Really good to see you, Aaron and Price. Um, I am uh, so kind of surprised to be interviewing you in a sense because uh, I actually voted for you a couple of times in uh, 2012 and 2016. I had worked on the Obama campaign uh, as an organizer and I went to the inaugural ball and wow. uh, was hoping that he would deliver change that we could believe in or or something to that effect and then uh when he didn't prosecute the torture people uh the torturers and he bailed out the banks but not the homeowners and it just became clear that uh, he was a huge fraud and it really radicalized me and sent me on a path to uh study the sort of dark side of the of this country we live in and now here you are again running for president on the green party ticket uh, and I get the sense that you were a bit reluctant as a nominee this time around because I didn't hear anything about this until all of a sudden Cornell West dropped out of the Green Party. So how, uh, if you could quickly summarize how you became, how you came to be the nominee and uh, my sense is that you were reluctant, but maybe you could elaborate on that. I hadn't planned on it, put it that way. And I was part of a small group that had basically, uh, you know, persuaded Cornell West to come out of the uh, gridlock and, and kind of the crisis that he was in with the People's Party. And, you know, we, we had long ago uh, uh, appealed to Cornell West to be a running mate. I think it was starting in 2012 and, you know, on, on the presidential ticket at that time because our agendas are very much uh, aligned and, you know, our work and we've crossed paths and, you know, collaborated for a long time. So we were like really shocked to hear that he was running with the People's Party and not so shocked to learn that that wasn't working out at all. And so we said, hey, Cornell, you know, our, our door is open. And, you know, the long and short of it is that it's very uh, challenging to build a relationship with a political party when you're in the heat of the fire, you know, and in a, in a presidential race, 
Uh, it's really hard to run under any circumstances, but with an independent party, it's not like they give you a campaign in a box, you know, which is what kind of the the uh, parties of war and Wall Street do. They kind of have the whole program. They got your database. They've got staff. You know, they have an agenda, and they've got your talking points too. You know, and they deliver it. And you know, so people can jump in uh, if they want to play that game. They can do that with with one of the uh, sold out you know, Wall Street parties, they can do that. But with a grassroots party, it doesn't work that way. You know, it's really, um, uh, you have to know the players, you have to know how it works. It, it requires a lot of trust and confidence in your working relationships and all that. And it's really hard to build that in a campaign of any sort if you haven't worked with that group before. Um, so, you know, it was, uh, uh, it was a tall order from the start and it wasn't surprising at all that it didn't work out. Um, and we heard only at the last minute that Dr. West had decided he was going to go independent. We like learned after the decision was made, there had been no discussion or any hint that there was a problem there. Um, you know, it's like when you work with a party, you, uh, you develop a whole set of skills of things you need to do and how you have to process things and work as a team. And if you've only been a solo pay player with a very powerful voice, uh, those set of skills aren't quite there. Uh, and, you know, that's basically, you know, what happened. So we learned at the very last minute when we had about three weeks to pull all our paperwork together in order to qualify for California. And we didn't want to lose uh, ballot access in California, which would otherwise cost maybe $4 million, maybe $5 million at the current going rate for uh, collecting signatures. Um, so at any rate, we had to really scramble uh, in order not to lose our ballot lines. And ballot lines you know, to make a long story short, that's how you challenge power. If you're an independent party and you're outside of this very corrupt sold out system, um, you have to gain access uh, to the ballot. And across the country, that means you have to gather a million signatures. It's a very expensive, labor intensive, and uh, extremely uh, fallible process. It's just laden with minefields because every state has their own um, their own set of rules, their rules are forever changing. You know, it's a system that's designed to keep challengers uh, off the ballot and to basically protect the, the powers that be. So it's very tough. And we built that system, you know, our ballot access um, over decades by challenging, by learning how to watchdog it, by maintaining our ballot access in between elections and so on. So we had a lot of the ballot access work done. Uh, what essentially amounts to 75% of the work was already done by the various state parties. So to make a long story short, we had to hurry up and get our paperwork and our FEC filings and all that together in order to run. And it was clear a newcomer wasn't gonna be able to do that it would it, it basically you know the the pressure was on for either Ajamu Baraka or myself to um, step up to the plate, and we had a long you know long drawn out knockdown struggle about who was going to run, and I wanted Ajamu to run, and he wanted me to run, and <laughs> the long and short of it is that he won the argument, so I had to step up. You know, and there wasn't any way I was going to let my life's work for the last twenty years just kind of unravel because we weren't going to challenge power in this election, you know, because if you don't use your ballot lines, you're going to lose your ballot lines. And, you know, and it would just be so demoralizing to the whole team that had basically, you know, the, all these grassroots uh, activists that had built this system for challenging empire, which is really what it is, what those ballot lines are. And we need them more than ever. Um, if I had confidence that a newcomer like Cornell uh, West might have been able to do it first time out of the starting gate, you know, it would, it would have given me pause. But I knew there was no way he would be able to do that. And that's being validated right now. Um, you know, he has access, I think, at this point to like something like seven states, but they're mostly small states with small um, uh, electoral college votes. So it's it's a tiny portion of the electorate. You can't challenge power unless you're really challenging power, unless you're really threatening their hegemony. And uh, as Greens, we basically started the race with 75% of the work done. Uh, it was around 17 state 
uh, ballot lines. It's now 21 with another three that are being approved. We've already done the work, uh, have qualified by a wide margin. So we're basically up to 24 states right now with another five or six to be uh, where the um, uh, the signatures will be turned in shortly. I won't drag you through the weeds on this, but we are very confident that we will be on the ballot on at least 48, if not 50 states. Um, and I can fill you in on New York if you're interested in that battle, which is really a, um, a very, uh, what can I say, illustrative uh, case of the struggle. And the struggle is ongoing. We'll be taking uh, New York to court. Um, but, you know, that said, New York was a huge victory for the grassroots resistance to empire. And it was very much, you know, outrage against genocide that was motivating so many people to kick in. So we fell just short of the requirement of 45,000 signatures, which is unhuman. It's absolutely New York changed their requirement basically to keep challengers off. And um, despite that, you know, they, they raised it up to 45,000 signatures in six weeks. You can only do that if you have the deep pockets of an RFK and you have, you know, a billionaire uh, donors, basically, then you can buy up all the signature collectors and offer them enough money that you're going to do it just with professionals and, and, and with a whole lot of funds. And um, as a grassroots campaign, you can't do that. So we had to do it really powered by uh, grassroots volunteers. And we exceeded all other uh, grassroots campaigns by at least a factor of 10. So we got 40, just it, the, the requirement was 45, we got 42,000. And no other candidate, including Dr. West, the Libertarians, and the Libertarians have been on every ballot in every state in the last two presidential cycles. They have never missed a state before. That tells you how outrageously difficult New York's new requirements are that even the libertarians who've never missed a state before, even they could only collect under 4,000 signatures. And we we exceeded them by tenfold. So it's a moral victory. And I think it's a real affirmation that, you know, that we are an unstoppable force in this election and we're going to continue to push forward. That's why, you know, I couldn't let this go, especially in this race where it's, a, it's really a perfect storm for, um, you know, for a political uprising, which is in the work. Which is also why it's more upsetting that there are three leftist anti-imperialist candidates. Uh, I, I think that that's kind of emblematic of the left in the, the U.S., unfortunately. And Cornell's campaign has taken a strange turn, I, I think, that he's been critical of you and of the Green Party, but in ways that he can't really substantiate from when I've heard him speak on the issue. I felt the timing of his move to independent was very strange because it came a few days after our, it became known that RFK was becoming independent, but before he'd even announced, and then Cornell just jumps. I, I think those things are related somehow, but I have no idea who's advising Cornell and to what end, but I thought that was very odd, and it's odd the way he talks about white supremacy now he almost sounds like a tiny he see coats or something it's a it's a i know he is sophisticated enough to realize the uh the different cr critiques of of white supremacy and so on and that he really is kind of kind of playing more of a liberal identity politics sort of role in a, in a strange way now i just i don't I, it really baffles me and it's really upsetting because i always admire the guy and I don't I don't really under, understand this and uh, I think I think part of it is he was he was afraid of becoming Ralph Nader in a sense and then uh, he he really does love to play to the crowd and that maybe that's what he was worried about but let me if we can I don't want to get too much into personalities uh, so much and I would imagine you're probably a little tired of that too so let me ask you a, a deeper question and then I think I, after this I think Bryce has uh, something to ask about uh, the situation in Palestine but for the part, a third party challenge right now, I think that part of what could be done potentially that would be positive, I'm not as pessimistic as some people with a grim view of the state of the US, because I actually think that if we manage not to blow up the world, the end of the US empire is kind of a prerequisite for doing anything. I realistically, I don't see the left as being in any kind of position to have any sort of revolution before 
while the U.S. is still in this position of global dominance. I think that somehow democracy needs to be reestablished, and that can't happen until the empire falls, and we're not doing anything to that end, but the rest of the world is. What do you see as the situation of the U.S. empire right now? What kind of danger does it pose to the world? And what kind of opportunities does its weakness uh, give us? Yeah, totally. I mean, we talk about empire and oligarchy go, go hand in hand. And empire is not only, you know, a disaster for the rest of the world, it's definitely a disaster for us here at home. Not only that it impoverishes us, makes it impossible for us to meet the needs of millions upon millions of Americans for healthcare and housing and education and to get out of debt and to have reasonable jobs, you know, good quality, well-paying jobs. Uh, empire, you know, we're spending half of our congressional budget uh, on endless wars that make us less safe, not more safe. Um, you know, and it's not lost on the American people that that's where our dollars are going. Uh, according to Jeffrey Sachs, the average American household this year alone has spent $12,000 in their taxes uh, for uh, to support the costs of empire, maintaining empire. $12,000 this year alone and over 50,000 since the post 9-11 wars began. Um, you know, so this has a devastating cost for Americans as well as the rest of the world. And given how empire is just brain dead, you know, and, and is uh, taking criminal risks, um, in the on the broader world stage and really risking nuclear confrontation on several fronts right now, including the proxy war, the U.S. proxy war with Russia in Ukraine and also in the Middle East. These are wars that can both blow up on us very readily and show signs of actively doing that. And they, you know, this is like a pre-World War I situation with nuclear weapons thrown into the mix. And few people know that a single nuclear armed submarine, and the US has 14 of them, a single uh, nuclear armed submarine uh, contains the firepower of 5,000 Hiroshima bombs. It, only, it doesn't take very many of those to basically uh, bring on nuclear winter, where the power of a nuclear detonation you know, what you see in the mushroom cloud is a lot of debris that's being propelled upward into the upper atmosphere where it does not settle for years or decades and where it basically filters out sunlight and agricultural production tanks. And you have global famine uh, to various degrees. But, you know, 5,000 Hiroshima bombs is uh, more than enough to kick us into total, um, uh, you know, famine global famine. And it's goodbye, you know, civilization as we know it. And probably most of humanity and a whole lot of other species. You know, if, if you wanted to survive uh, when the meteor hit the earth, you know, and extinguished the dinosaurs, that was basically what happens in a, in a nuclear, uh, you know, with sufficient nuclear uh, detonation, you get a, a, a dinosaur type extinction event. You know, you had to be smaller than a squirrel uh, to survive that, you know, given the uh, collapse of the food supply. So, the risks that are being taken with all of our lives right now are just off the charts. And, you know, that's very much why we need opposition politics um, in this race. And to your last point about there being three, you know, progressive anti-imperial candidates, it's true, there are, but the reality is that there will only be one of us on the ballot. There will only be one of us that is actually an option to vote for. So this is going to funnel down anyhow. Uh, the three candidates that are all promoting this really critical program, uh, we are not going to be splitting the vote. There will only be one of us that is on track now and that um, will be on the ballot for all or nearly all voters. And by the way, if we don't get on the ballot in New York, we, you know, we are fighting this in court, so we may yet, but the uh, worst case scenario is that we're a write-in campaign. And if you conduct a very vigorous write-in, you can, prevail as Joe Biden just did. He just had to run a ride in in New Hampshire in that primary and he got 70% of the vote. You know, so we intend to be on the ballot for all voters. There will be no other campaign that's on for more than a fraction of voters, a tiny fraction, maybe 5%. So, um, you know, I think this, uh, this will be part of the uh, messaging that we badly need to, you know, a united front 
to stop fascism and to stop empire, which goes hand in hand with fascism, uh, we need a united front. In my view, the sooner we unite, the better, because there's only this all narrows down to one pathway. It is very clear. You know, in New York, our campaign collected over 42,000 signatures. Dr. West collected over 3,000. You know, that is sort of a um, a real indicator of what the energy, the strategic, um, you know, guidance of each of these campaigns. It's very hard to run for president if you don't have a very experienced team. And there's really no one with experience on Dr. West's team because of the way he's decided to run it as, you know, as the powerful voice that he is, but it's a solo voice. So, you know, there, there really is not competition out there in the general election. And, you know, in my view, it's very important to have his voice in this, uh, but the sooner we join forces to ensure that uh, we are on the ballot strong across the country, um, including New York, we have tough battles coming up in Illinois and Indiana. Um, but other than that, you know, it's basically, um, you know, all downhill from here. So we can do this. It will be a unified force uh, at the end of the day. Yeah, and you press on one of, you know, the most important issues of our time is how we're going to handle uh, this threat, this nuclear sword of Damocles that's hanging over our heads. And uh, as Aaron mentioned, there are many places in the world that it could erupt. There's Taiwan, there's Ukraine, uh, but especially there's uh, Palestine. And there's what's uh, going on in Gaza with Israel's genocidal campaign uh, to, you know, ethnically cleanse uh, the Gaza Strip. I mean, there's no doubt about that being their goal. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of reasons why the Americans still support Israel. Uh, you know, some people argue that there are strategic reasons or geostrategic reasons that they support Israel. Uh, but some argue that the reason is more domestic. The fact that Israel and its supporters have been able to develop such a strong and powerful lobby uh, that it makes supporting Israel the path of least resistance uh, for most, if uh, if not all of our politicians. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm wondering, A, how you see that situation developing uh, if current trends persist, and also what you would do to alter those trends. Uh, you know, the, the president doesn't have supreme power over every aspect of this country. You know, they still have to contend with uh, a powerful lobby if it comes after them. Uh, but that has to eventually be taken on and uh, dismantled uh, if there is to be any hope for the future. Uh, but of course, going against them might uh, uh, trigger negative political consequences. And it's delicate enough that since Israel has nuclear weapons, uh, they hold a bit of a, not a trump card, but a very powerful card in any sort of uh, negotiations or uh, geostrategic dealings. So I'm curious about how you view the situation and the, the players and factors involved. Yeah, so let me start with that last point first, because that is a real um, conundrum. Israel has nuclear weapons, and the highest bodies, you know, of the land, the United Nations, um, uh, the Security Council, the International Court of Justice, and the International Criminal Court, they have all, you know, weighed in on this uh, to the extent that they can, to their uh, greatest capacity. They have all basically given Israel an order to cease and desist, especially in Rafa, where, you know, this is genocide on steroids basically going on right now before our very eyes. It's just appalling. And all of our international bodies have come down in very uh, clear terms that it has to end. And I think, you know, it is very true that Israel has uh, you know, has the kind of trump card here. You know, they do have nuclear weapons and they have exhibited, um, you know, what shall we say, sufficient recklessness. It's not hard to imagine at all. I'd say recklessness and also uh, immorality um, that uh, is very easy to imagine Israel uh, resorting to nuclear weapons. And so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not going to be possible, for example, to send in the troops uh, to deal with this. And it's very clear, you know, we need to use all other mechanisms, but we do have a lot of other mechanisms. And for example, Joe Biden is one of those mechanisms. The president of the United States has, has stopped Israel many times before, starting with uh, Dwight Eisenhower back in the 1950s, when, um, when Israel uh, was told in no uncertain terms uh, that they had to 
uh, withdraw their their troops. Um, at that time, it was Egypt. Um, they were going into Egypt, Israel, and I think the UK and France. someone else. France. Okay, thank you. They were all in Egypt, and um, you know, uh, Dwight Eisenhower says it's over, and they responded, from what I understand, pretty promptly. And likewise, in the 1980s, Ronald Reagan, not exactly your most progressive or peace-loving president, he said the same thing, picked up the phone, and um, Menachem Begin basically said, well, okay. And um, the bombing and the missile strikes stopped immediately. That was in Lebanon, where they had gone to pursue the PLO, which was you know, the Hamas of its day that somehow managed to you know, redeem itself in the eyes of uh, US empire uh, eventually, but they were the Hamas of the day and the, U the US was in pursuit, um, basically uh, murdering civilians in, in Lebanon. And, uh, you know, and, and Reagan picked up the phone and it basically was over. It's outrageous that Biden has not done that. He is fully uh, in support of Israel's you know, genocide. And the U.S. is providing 80% of the weapons. We just learned this week that, in fact, uh, it's Boeing, uh, or at least Boeing is implicated in the in the weapons that are slaughtering uh, women and children in Rafa right now. You know, it's just outrageous what's going on with the full support of the U.S. And Begin has, ref Begin, <laughs> um, <laughs> Biden, <laughs> Biden <laughs> has refused, right? He, he, he could be Netanyahu, actually, or Netanyahu's secretary, you know, because he's refused to hold Netanyahu accountable for anything, you know, including the bombing of Iran's embassy, which was essentially an act of war. You know, Iran wants to drag the U.S. into a larger war, especially with Iran. Um, you know, oh, so, you mean Israel wants to drag America into a larger war? Yes, I'm sorry. What did I say? Uh, you said Iran wants to, but uh, that's fine. Yes, right, right. Okay. All these countries okay. flying around. It's, it's, right. Netanyahu wants to drag us into that war uh, with Iran. I think Iran definitely does not want a war uh, by any means and is doing its best to avoid it and has, it, has had a very muted response to Israel's uh, provocations. But Biden, Biden wouldn't even hold Netanyahu accountable for basically you know, initiating an act of war. Uh, so how would you use your presidential power to uh, hold Israel accountable, but also make it so that there is a, a chance for a domestic opposition to Israel to take hold without this lobby going crazy? What sort of powers are available to uh, uh, the executive? So uh, many powers, for example, the executive, even without dealing with APAC, and APAC can be dealt with and should be dealt with. APAC should be uh, classified as a foreign agent, and then its ability to lobby basically goes out the window. And I know that JFK had intended to do that before he was assassinated, you know, so these things don't go down lightly. Um, but that, you know, APEC needs to be ended as a lobbying force. It is essentially an agent of Israel, and it should not have the ability to decide our elections, which is what it does, and to determine the votes of our Congress people who you know, in my view, need to be removed from power as quickly as possible, especially the leadership and anyone who takes APAC money. Uh, you know, they've kind of demonstrated where their loyalty lies. Um, you know, they are voting out of step with the American people in opposition to the American people in order to vote with their funders, you know, and on the, on the larger frame, uh, we need to basically get big money out of politics and establish public funding because the same thing that trips us up in foreign policy also trips us up on health care, on um, student debt, on housing. You know, I mean, you name it. The American people are being screwed on all of these counts and support by huge numbers, um, uh, very much support uh, getting money out of politics and having publicly funded elections. But we don't have to wait for that. The president has the authority uh, to basically uh, shut down the transfer of weapons. And by the way, it's illegal to be uh, uh, supplying weapons to uh, countries who are violating human rights, who are interfering with the delivery of U.S. humanitarian aid and also, I just learned this one the other day, uh, countries who are in violation of uh, nuclear uh, weapons agreements, which uh, Israel is. They are in violation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. So for all those reasons, it's actually illegal for the president to continue uh, transferring weapons uh, to Israel. So this is a piece of cake as to how to shut it down. And anyone who maintains that, oh, this is way too difficult, uh, you know, does not deserve uh, even your consideration. 
uh, for holding the major office. <laughs> Here's one question, because I've done a lot of work on the high crimes of the U.S. The clandestine state and how basically Wall Street decided in World War II that we were going to go for global empire. And they also decided we were going to need a CIA. And from that decision, the two decisions, really, I think that we have a number of scandals and crimes uh, that really are, that have metastasized to enormous proportions. They've had an impact on history that we don't even really, that we can't, um, we can't fully understand. Do you support truth and reconciliation in order to uh, basically expose and deal with, address, acknowledge uh, crimes like the political assassinations of the 60s, the long connections between the state and organized crime and, the, and management, it seems, even of the drug traffic for nefarious geopolitical purposes, basic sexual blackmail. I mean, everything under the sun, pretty much they've done that you can think of because they have people trying to think of everything that they can think of and infinite money. How would you deal with this issue of our dark, dark history and the secrecy and criminality that's been at the apex of this project uh, for decades? Exactly. And I think there's no getting out of this uh, unless we actually take on the whole system. We are not going to fix, um, you know, the genocidal war and the ethnic cleansing uh, in Palestine without also addressing the empire, which it is an expression of. And I think your suggestion of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, you know, uh, would be really, really important. And I wonder, you know, is that a congressional committee? You know, is that like uh, bringing back the church committee, you know, which became what the foreign, um, the, the, the Senate Intelligence Committee, I believe, you know, but has totally lost its mission. You know, it's become a collaborator rather than, you know, rather than a watchdog. Um, you know, we need to clean house a whole lot. But I think that um, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission is a really great idea. And I would be very interested to hear your thoughts about, you know, what would that look like? What is the, um, you know, what's the framing of that? And how do we get it going as quickly as possible? Because, um, you know, people really know that something is badly off. You know, they know that their lives are um, falling apart, really, in every dimension. 50% of renters who can't keep a roof over their heads, um, you know, 87 million Americans who don't have adequate health care as our health statistics continue to go down the tubes, you know, and Americans are succumbing to chronic illness in a way that just, you know, uh, excel, exceeds every other, you know, uh, developed industrial nation. Um, you know, the student debt that people are mired in and can't get out of, you know, for which the president has made false promises and, you know, uh, basically does window dressing, you know, the climate crisis, um, which is, you know, 126 degrees in, in, um, uh, in India, you know, it, the climate is also going off the charts. And this genocide that we're watching is absolutely, you know, intolerable. So the American people really know that there's something wrong. They support an immediate end to the genocide and a diplomatic solution. They're already on board in spite of this wall of propaganda 24 seven coming from the Department of Defense. The American people get that something is really rotten in Denmark, except it's not Denmark, you know, it's, it's like the US empire. There's something really rotten and it's impacting our lives. Our lives have become unlivable. You know, uh, at least 50% of young people describe themselves as hopeless. 25% have considered harming themselves within the last two weeks of a poll. You know, so this is not a world that's going to survive very long on all counts, including our own mental health. You know, so we badly need a fix and we need to take on the totality of this problem. We're not going to fix it around the margins. We really need to dismantle empire and oligarchy and the rising fascist threat as well. We don't have to wait for Donald Trump, it's here. So all of that needs, um, it needs a fix. And addressing, you know, the overarching empire that really um, contains and um, uh, makes inevitable this crisis and all these crises, we need to get to the root of the problem. So I would very much welcome a continuing conversation um, about how exactly we do that 
and you know for us to start talking about that sooner rather than later because we need we need to bring up the you know this crisis of empire in a in a way that says here's how we can move forward i mean it's it's clear we just need to shift our you know our budget we need to shift our budget and our priorities and that will do it but to help develop the um the public support and the mobilization to make that happen it would very much help i think to have an institution that's educating people about what exactly the problem is how it is continuing and how we bring it to a successful transition to create an america and a world that works for all of us we can have that and uh, empire needs to be dismantled as part of that process well, you know, all empires do end, and it is the hubris and folly of our imperial overlords that they thought that they were exceptional, that they thought that they were special, and that the rules of history didn't apply to them. But they do. Uh, for all of your work uh, on this, on these elections, and uh, raising consciousness about our, our problems that the mainstream will not acknowledge, uh, I salute you, Dr. Stein, and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Bryce. I look forward to the continuing conversation. Thank you for your work. Absolutely. Take care. Bye-bye now. Thanks to Dana Chavaria for producing this episode, and thank you for tuning in. Special thanks to Fordide Trying for supporting the Devil's Chess Club. Visit FordiTrying.com for details. And don't forget to subscribe to the American Exception podcast on Patreon for the best coverage of the deep politics of the U.S. empire. This includes our new series on the global drug meta group, a milieu that appears to have staged the 1999 Moscow apartment bombings, which were blamed on Chechen jihadis, though some Americans went on to call it a Russian false flag. The attacks are sometimes described as the Russian 9-11, I think that there's a lot of reason to suspect that the false flag was carried out by drug trafficking, anti-Russian, pro-Western forces, and there's much reason to suspect that some of these networks were also deeply involved in the American 9-11 a couple years later. In closing, I want to thank Jill Stein for appearing here and for running the best 2024 presidential campaign for peace and justice. This is a very strange election year. On the one hand, good people in the U.S. are totally disenfranchised by our parafascist political regime. And yet, something has to give eventually, since internationally, the empire is presently getting clobbered on the devil's chessboard. <laughs>